We're continuing our series that we've had on faith that works when life doesn't. It's out of the book of James. And if you have your Bibles this morning, find James chapter 5. Now, I've been trying to keep things in James. Of course, we've been doing James. But I have every now and again jumped around a little bit. I'm jumping all the way to the end. We're going to go back in next uh, in later lessons. But I thought this was such a relevant lesson for what we're dealing with. And I've told you all along that James is a book that is tremendously practical. It's dealing with things that you and I deal with. What are we missing? What about the camera? Oh, it's off? Am I not broadcasting? This one? Well, it's, it's saying it's on up here. All right. Leave me alone. <laughs> now, I appreciate it. He looks after me. He looks after me. But if I didn't give him a hard time, it would be right. So, uh, you know, he does. Y'all just don't know what he says to me when y'all are not here. I, I regularly get threatened to be thrown out that window up there. So just so y'all know. So, but I ain't scared of him. But anyway, <laughs> we, uh, now I forgot where I was. You messed me up. We were talking about... Uh, James and being so practical. James is a book that was written to people who are undergoing difficult days. And, of course, over the past year or so, and and life itself is really difficult. Today, we're getting into a section that I think affects every one of us. I know I deal with this a lot, on being patient. Patience is something that a lot of us desire, and we want it right now. You know, the world is changing all the time, and we're told we need you to do this, and we need you to do that. And again, we talk about things, quote, getting back to normal, and we're thinking, that's what we hear for last year. And, you know, we're hoping that this pandemic might, you know, we began, what, when we started. Oh, it's, we want you to, to, uh, to be by yourself, pull away from everybody for a couple of weeks. We're just going to try to slow this thing down a little bit. A year later, they're still saying the same thing. Oh, we just want to do this. Oh, we'll do it for three weeks. Well, we're going to do it for a couple of months. We wound up, like say, a year. And if I had to, a word to describe the way most people are feeling today, I would think it would be the word fatigued. Isn't that true? We're tired of it. Everybody's tired. We're tired of change. We're tired of being cooped up. We're tired of some people are being out of work. People are just generally worn out from all the changes that they've had to make because of, of our political situations that we're in and the virus that we've been dealing with. We really don't like to be patient anymore. And I've noticed that a lot. There is a whole lot more domestic violence right now. There is a tremendous amount of road rage that goes on right now. There are a lot of people who are just plain rude right now. And I think it's because of the things that are going on. So we're in this series in James for many weeks. This is the 11th lesson on the series that we've generally been talking about, again, the book in order, but, but I'm jumping over to chapter 5 because I do believe it's so relative to what we're dealing with. And since I know you're impatient, I'm going to rush over this text that we're talking about because I feel what God wants us, that's what he wants us to talk about today. You know, sometimes the greatest step in faith you can make is just simply to do nothing. Simply wait on God. And honestly, that is not easy. It's hard. Waiting when things aren't moving as fast as you want them to move takes a lot more faith than going out and doing something impulsively. Let me read to you James chapter 5, 7 through 11. This is going to be our text for today. And you might want to put a star behind it or highlight it because this is one you need to go back and forth with a lot. Here's what he says. Be patient, my friends, until the Lord comes back. Remember how patient farmers are as they wait for their valuable crops to mature and to ripen. They also wait patiently for the spring and the fall rains to do their work. You too must be patient. You hearing how many times he's saying this in these couple of verses? You too must be patient. Don't give up because the Lord could arrive at any time. 
and don't complain. Oh, I'll read that again. Some of y'all missed that. And don't complain, especially against each other. And I, this next part needs a star, or you will be judged by God. Don't fuss about each other. We get impatient, and that's what we do when we get impatient. Remember that the real judge is standing at the door. In other words, he's watching you. Another example of patience in the face of suffering in God's, is God's prophets who spoke God's truth in hard times. Today we honor them for their patient endurance when they suffered unjustly. Then remember the example of Job. Job continued to patiently trust to God while enduring great pain. But we know how God fulfilled his purpose for Job and that his plan for Job ended in good because the Lord always treats us with tender compassion and merciful kindness. Great verses. That's James 5, 7 through 11. Learning to wait patiently is one of the most difficult lessons that we can learn in life. It's a mark of maturity. Children and immature people are impatient. Isn't that right? You know, I want it now. I want it now. We're the only generation that ever stands, that's ever done where they, we stand before our microwave and say, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. But we're like kids. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Mom and dad, are we there yet? And James shows up. He shows us the when and the why of how to develop patience when things are not, well, not going like we thought they ought to. They're taking longer than maybe we expected it to take. Now, all of us have spent a great percentage of our time living, waiting. And there are many, many things that test our patience. Freeways. Market lines. Doctor's visits. You know, it's amazing to me. You go to a doctor's office and you'll make an appointment for a doctor. And if you're 15 minutes late, they'll drop you. But if they're an hour late seeing you, they just say, Pfft. you know. If you don't show up, they'll give you maybe 10, 15 minutes and they'll take you off. You come in 10, 15, you're going to have to reschedule. Sorry. I'm going to say, well, I'm just making up for the 45 minutes you made me wait last time. But no, you know, but, but what we do, we get impatient, don't we? I know why they are, and I don't, by the way, I'm, not, I'm making a joke because I just assume you take your time, Joan, because I hope you're going to take your time when you take your time with me. Make somebody else wait for me when I need it. So, you know, but I'm just saying, we do get impatient, don't we? You know, and all these things test our patience. We don't like to be delayed. The truth is we hate to wait. I, you know, I particularly don't like to wait when I'm hungry. I don't know about you, but I don't like to wait when I'm hungry. I don't know about you, but, but you, know, you know, I'm not very patient when I'm hungry. And so when I go in the restaurant, I have to wait for five different things that often make me grumpy when I'm really hungry. I mean, I have to wait to be seated. I have to wait to get a menu. I have to wait to order. I have to wait for the food to be served. And then I have to wait for the bill. And they, are, they had the audacity to call that guy the waiter. I'm the one doing all the waiting. Today, I want us to look at how faith waits patiently. Six times in this passage I just read to you, he talks about patience. He talks about perseverance. And James gives us three examples, three illustrations, lessons he says you can learn from farmers, you can learn from the prophets, and he says you can learn from a man named Job. And we're going to look at all three of these in these verses to teach us how to be patient and how to to, when it's taking longer than we expect it to, to deal with it. And I want us to look at just three questions. I want, us, I, I want us to ask, when is waiting patiently an act of faith? When is it an act of faith? What should I remember while I am waiting? And how do I trust God when I'm waiting for something when I've been delayed? All right, let's look at the three things from James chapter 5. If you have your Bibles, again, turn over there. And when we're waiting patiently, it's an act of faith. When is that? When is it an act of faith? Well, we all need patience all the time, but there are three times when patience is especially needed. That's what we're going to talk about today. 
three times when patience is especially needed and especially important in your life. And that's what James talks about. You might write these down. I'm going to give you the, the why we need. I, I said we're going to talk about three different things. The first one is what I'm talking about today. The other two we'll talk about next week. It has to do, he uses a farmer and the prophets and Job. First, he says, we need to be patient when circumstances are uncontrollable. When circumstances are uncontrollable. Now, that certainly applies to what you're going through right now with all the different things that are beyond our control, that they're making regulations and rules and asking you to do things that are beyond your control in this global pandemic. But the truth is a lot of life, most of life, actually is beyond your control. James uses the farmer as an example. Look at verse 7 and 8. He says, be patient, my friend, until the Lord comes back. Remember how patient farmers are as they wait for their valuable crops to mature and to ripen. They also wait patiently for the spring and the fall rains to do their work. You too must be patient. Don't give up because the Lord could arrive at any time. You say, well, the Lord is coming. I don't think I can wait that long. Well, he says, say, look at what the farmers do. Look how a farmer does. Farming requires a lot of patience. There's no overnight crops. You put something in the ground and then you wait and 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 you till and you, you plant and you, you, you seed and you prune and you weed and eventually after a whole lot of waiting, you harvest. But more than that, farmers include, being a farmer includes many uncontrollable factors. Farmers can't control the weather. They can't control the economy. They can't control labor prices. It, it, it takes a lot of faith to be a farmer. And even when we, we know something is uncontrollable, we'll still try to control it. And that's what we do. That's how we do that. Well, if you ever want to know if you're trying to control the uncontrollable, ask yourself, am I worrying about it? Honestly, one of the things that I've noticed this year especially over the past few months with all the political turmoil added on to the, the stuff with the virus is how everybody is trying to control the uncontrollable. Someone will say about, you know, they'll come up with all these different things, these scenarios and everything, and, and they'll say, oh, man, uh, Mitchell, you know, what are you going to do about this? And they're wringing their hands and they say, you know, something's fixing to happen and all these things are going to happen. They say, well, what are you going to do about this? And I'm going to say, nothing. What can I do about it? Let's just say all these things you're telling me is going to happen. What do you want me to do? Now, I know you could do certain things. I, you know, for instance, that, now I've done this. It hadn't been because of this year. I've done this for probably 18, 20 years now. I keep a supply of food in my house for a natural disaster. I lived in Paducah, Kentucky, by, uh, you know, for several, uh, for years, two years. And, and uh, we had the four, the four rivers there. And I would always meet with, uh, I was working emergency services there too, and we would have FEMA meetings on a regular basis, and they were saying, look, uh, y'all are in the worst spot you could probably be, Paducah, Kentucky. So because you've got four rivers coming in, if there's ever a natural disaster, it, these, you, it, we won't be able to get to you because these, all these bridges will be out. You need to be prepared. Don't expect to see us for two weeks. That's what they told us. Don't expect to see anybody from the government for two weeks. You remember when Katrina hit? Remember all those people there and wringing their hands saying, why isn't somebody coming to get what they didn't prepare? I mean, I, I believe you ought to prepare, but you not need to worry. You do what you can and don't worry about everything else. So I keep a supply. Of, I keep, I have five boxes. I, I probably shouldn't tell this because if something happens, y'all be coming to my house. But uh, I've got five boxes of MREs at my house that I keep all the time. I keep some things available all the time. With those MREs, I also have an AR, by the way, just so you know. Uh, <laughs> that's for my MREs. But, you know, what I, but, but I'm saying, you know, you do need to make a certain amount of preparation, but you can't sit around and wring your hands all the time worrying about what's going to happen all the time. Live your life and go on and quit worrying about it. That's what we do when an uncontrollable situation comes up because to worry about something is to try to control it. 
To worry about something that you can't change is dumb. So worry about something that you can't change it unless, you know, the Bible says that when we worry, we're actually trying to control the uncontrollable. He says the farmer doesn't do that. What does he do? He just waits. Now, again, that doesn't mean he doesn't do something. I mean, he tills the soil, he plants the seed, he weeds it, he does all those things. But most of what he does is wait. And he trusts God in the things that he can't control. When the circumstances are uncontrollable, guess what you need? Patience. Patience. Number two, you need patience when the truth is unpopular. When the truth is unpopular, that's what's in the next verse. You know, sometimes as followers of Jesus, you're going to have to speak up. Sometimes as a follower of Jesus, you're going to have to tell people what you believe about something, even when it's not popular. You're going to have to tell the truth even when people don't like to hear it, when they deny it, when they don't want it, when it is unpopular. The only thing they want to hear is what they want to hear, and they get upset when you speak the truth. Boy, we've really gotten that way lately. You know, they, they, nobody wants to hear anybody. That means that the truth isn't always popular. And of course, today our culture wants to believe a lot of lies that aren't simply true. We want to believe lies about ourselves that aren't true. And so next, James gives us a second example of how, why we need to be patient. Here's who he uses. James chapter 5, 11 and, uh, 10 and 11. Another example of patience in face of suffering is God's prophets who spoke God's truth in hard times. Today, we honor them for their patient endurance when they suffered unjustly. He says, he says, he says another example of patience in the face of suffering is God's prophets who spoke the truth in hard times. In other words, people didn't want to hear it, but it was the truth that they needed to hear. Today, he says, we honor them. We honor them for their patient endurance and their suffering during these times. Now, the duty of a prophet is to get the people to change their ways, to get them to turn back to God. The duty of the prophet was to get people to be different, to change their behavior, to look from where they were looking at, look to God. The problem, people resist change. They resist change even if it's good for them. We don't like change. And when you suggest a change for somebody, they often resent you for for just suggesting it. Even if they need it. You know, I think of an example, you know, a verse that you might want to put in your effort. You probably don't need to put that because you make people mad if you use it. But it says, "Have have I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Well, oftentimes that's exactly what happens. So the prophet had to deal with being a lot, with a lot of unpopular statements and being very well, not very well liked by a lot of different people. Prophets were often maligned. They were often misunderstood. If you read the Bible, they were criticized. They were often very unpopular. They, they were discouraged. By the way, let me give you some advice. If you need to be popular in life, don't be a prophet, okay? Because their job was to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. Of course, by the way, that's what a preacher's job is too. My job is to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. If you're sitting here comfortable, my job is to make you uncomfortable. And, of course, people don't like it when they're made uncomfortable. They would not only tell it like it is, but they would tell it like it should be and tell it like it could be. Prophets, as a result, because the truth isn't always popular, they had to be patient because people don't change quickly. Prophets had to be patient. By the way, so do preachers. I noticed that when I talk about certain subjects and sin and, 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 you know, that some suddenly people say, you know what, you better be careful talking about that because people, you know, you'll hurt somebody's feelings. Well, you know what? I'd rather hurt their feelings than lose their soul. Second Timothy chapter 4 and verse 2 says, preach the word. Be instant, instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering of doctrine. What does he mean by that? Preach it when they like it. Preach it when they don't. Preach it when they'll listen. Preach it when they won't. But preach the word. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Preach it when they like it. 
in season. Preach it when they don't, out of season. I understand that the truth makes us uncomfortable, but what I'm supposed to do, that's what I'm supposed to do as a preacher. Speak the truth in love, love everybody, and be patient with everybody. I'm not allowed, by the way, to be impatient with anybody. I'm not supposed to. I have to be patient with everybody, even when I'm trying to help them change into what God wants them to be. Uh, you know, have you ever tried to change somebody's mind when they don't want it changed? Pretty futile task, I'll just tell you. If they can only see their own ways. So what are you going to do when you're trying to change your husband or your wife or your child or somebody else? Be patient. Be patient. In the Bible, the New Testament was written in Greek, and the word for patience in Greek, uh, you're going to get this, it's called macrothumus. That's the word for patience. Macrothumus. It's a word we get thermometer from, which measures heat. And what macrothumus means is, it means, patience is, it means it takes it a long time to get hot. That's what it literally means. That's what it is. It takes a long time for it to get hot. You don't blow up. You don't, you don't, have, a, you, you don't have a short fuse. You've got a long fuse. You don't get overheated with people just because they don't agree with you. If you're going to be success with people, you're going to have to learn to be patient. If you're going to be a successful parent, you're going to, you, you can't get overheated. You have to be a long fuse. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the classic passage on love, verse 4, the very first characteristic of love is this. Love is patient. The very first one. In the same way, the same word, it's the same word, the, 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 that long... Long fused, macrothumus. It takes a long time to get hot. What that means is you don't grumble about people while you're waiting. And when you're going through times where you don't like and you're having to wait and you're, going to, you're having long delays going on, we often start grumbling about the people around us, don't we? Number one, I think it's the reason we do that. I think the reason we do that is because when things aren't going the way we like it to do, we want to blame somebody for it because it can't be me. So I have to blame somebody for it so we get short fused. James chapter 5 verse 9 says this, Don't grumble about each other, my brothers and sisters, or God will judge you. Pretty plain. That's a New Living Translation. Remember, the great judge is coming. He is standing at the door. So let's review. When do we need to be patient? When do we need that long-term waiting of faith? When circumstances are uncontrollable, and when the truth that you have to share is unpopular. Those are two reasons why you need to be patient. Be patient with people. Love them and be patient with them. Number three, we need to be patient when pain is unbearable and unexplainable. Circumstances are, uncontrol circumstances are uncontrollable. People are unchangeable. But when pain is unbearable and unexplainable, that's when you need patience too. Now, the classic example is, and he uses right here, is the story of Job. The story of Job. Job was the wealthiest man in the world at that particular time. Very famous man, had everything in the world. All in a single day, he lost it all. All of his family was killed by terrorists. He lost all of his crops. He lost all of his livestock. He got terrible, painful, terminal disease. He literally lost everything in a day. He didn't understand what was going on. There were no explanations. Job was a godly man. He feared God. He loved God. He served God. And yet literally lost everything in a day. It was a test. And yet in the entire time where Job is testing, where God was allowing Job to be tested in his faith, Satan comes and says, you know, your man Job, the only reason he's serving you is because, because he's got it so good. He's got it so good. That's the only reason he's following you. If you were to give him any problems, he'd, he'd, he'd deny you. God says, no, no, you don't know my man Job. And he allows Satan to take away all these things that were good in his life, and Job still served God. He was patient, and he was trusting. In James chapter 5, verse 11, it says, then remember the example of Job. He said, Job continued 
patiently to trust God while enduring great pain. We know that later, in fact, we know how God fulfilled his purpose for Job and that it is planned for Job, his plans for Job had ended in good because the Lord always treats us with tender compassion and mercy and kindness. Then at the end of Job's life, the Bible says, God restored everything that he had double. Double. Now, Job, this guy played in the Super Bowl of suffering and he won the championship. He was a committed believer. He lost everything, family, friends, finances, health, everything. He literally lost everything. His children were murdered. He went bankrupt. He has painful, incurable disease. You talk about a rough day he was having. You think about a problem. The only thing that he had left was his wife. Makes you kind of wonder. The only thing he had left was his wife who was nagging him and saying, why don't you just curse God and die? I mean, really, isn't that what happened? That's not much of a support system. <laughs> but the worst part of Job's life is that there were no apparent explanations for what was going on. You couldn't explain it. He's got no idea what's going on. He's just going. But why? Why me? And from, for 37 chapters God says nothing to Job. He's silent. But in that silence, God preserved. He, he, Job persevered, and he hung in there, and, and he refused to give up, and he patiently waited for God. The ultimate example of faith. Though he slay me, he said, yet will I trust him. Yet will I trust him every day. Yet he will slay me. I'm going to trust God even though I don't understand what's going on. Even though I don't know why these circumstances are like they are. Friend, whether it's coronavirus or anything else in life, life is not fair. By the way, that used to be my favorite thing to teach our kids. Is life's not fair. I'd have, we'd go do something and, Something would happen. One kid would get something, maybe the other. I, I, don't, I didn't believe in all this stuff. That if you have a birthday party, you've got to give every kid there a gift. <laughs> it, ain't your, it ain't your birthday. Uh, give everybody a gift. Uh, but some kids say, well, that's just not fair. He got that, and I didn't get that. That's just not fair. You know what I tell them? Good lesson for life. Because life's not fair. Nobody ever told you it was going to be fair. God never promised you that it was going to be fair. If you think that your life, that, you're, that somehow your existence is, is all around fairness, you are wrong. It's not. It's just there's a lot of injustice in this world. We've seen it in the violence that we've seen. We've seen it in the virus. We've seen it in the pandemic. We've seen it in the protest. We've seen it in, in, in the injustice in the world. And sometimes we can't figure out our problems. And then there's what, there's what Job went through. Here's what we need to do next. What I should remember. What should I remember when I'm waiting on God in times when I'm going through pain and problems and pressures and, and, and what do I remember when, God, when I'm waiting on God? That's what we're going to talk about next week. James gives us three reminders in our next week's lesson. But I'm going to tell you, you need to remember that things don't always go the way you want them. But you need to remember that, to be patient, to be patient with people in all these different circumstances. And he gives us all these different things. You know, when this pandemic drags on and as it takes longer, What's it going to take? I want you to focus on this, these things that, you know, all these things that he talks about here about being patient, be patient, be patient, be patient, be patient. Because God is patient with us. Could you imagine if God acted like we did? Man, I can tell you this. If God acted like we did, we wouldn't be here. None of it. He would have. He would have got rid of this world a long time ago if he wasn't a patient God. We need to know. Job is a good example. And again, kids, you know, if you don't learn anything today that Mitchell said, remember this: life isn't just. Life isn't fair. It isn't fair. It isn't. 
So don't, want, don't be whining when it's not. Just know that that's the way life is, but that's okay. You be fair even when life is not fair. Isn't that right? That's right. God is good. And if we're going to make life enjoyable, we've got to be patient. You know, because either it's going to, it's, it, you know, there's a, what, uh, someone said their favorite verse was, it came to pass. That's the way it ought to be with Christians. It came to pass. Whatever you're going through right now, you know, you may think it's going to last forever, but it's not. You may think that, that your problems that you have are, are never going to go away. It won't. It will go away. You'll either, you'll either get a resolution here or the hereafter, but it'll, you'll have a resolution to whatever you're going through. Just be patient. You know, it's amazing when you know the end, you know, when you know there's an end to something that how, it, how much easier it is to be patient. You know, if I know that, I, I, you know, I've got to, I, you know, if I take this and I, I take, do this particular thing, um, whatever it is I have is going to be taken care of. And if I'm sick, I'll take the medicine. I hate taking medicine. I hate to take a pill worse than anything. I go to Joan. I say, I'd rather take a shot. I'd rather have a shot than a pill. But if I had to take a pill, I'll take a pill, whatever it takes to get it done. But if I had to take it, the only reason I take it is because I know that if I take it, there's an end to it that I'm going to feel better at the end. But when you don't see the light at the end of the tunnel, it's hard to be patient, isn't it? That's why he reminds us over and over in this chapter, Remember the Lord is coming. Remember the Lord is coming. Remember, he says, he could come at any time. Be ready. Now, if you're here this morning and, and you're not ready because you're not ready for the Lord to come, if he were to come today, would you be ready? If he were to come, you leave here, you, you start home, and the world ends. Maybe you have a wreck or maybe... Someone drops an atomic bomb or maybe, you know, a meteor strikes the earth and the whole earth disappears. Would you be ready? Because the Lord's coming. Or maybe you're just riding down the road and poof, you hear the shout of the archangel and the trumpets and the Lord and you look to, and the Lord's coming and, and he, forever shall you be with him in the air. Are you ready for, will you be with him forever in the air? If not, maybe you need to make that right today. There's some of you maybe need to just come forward and repent and say, you know what, I've not been as patient as I need to be. I need prayers for patience, for perseverance. We've got time. If we could handle all y'all, if you need to come forward. But whatever we need to do, we need to start trusting to God more than we have because really lack of patience is a lack of trust. We need to start trusting our God. If we could help you this morning, if we pray with you, for you, if you need to obey the gospel, come to God and have God in your life where you could be ready when he comes. We want to help you as we stand. We offer the invitation.